well. So it's my um, happy duty this evening to introduce um, our guest speaker. And it's um, a great pleasure to introduce Ms. Kate Clark, who I'm sure is very well known to many of you. But for those who don't know Kate, she is known internationally as an innovator, a strategic thinker and developer of creative solutions and an out of, box, out of the box thinker um, in the heritage space. She's had a long um, and distinguished international career um, in heritage management and policy. And I'll just mention a few of those positions. Most recently, as the CEO of CADU in uh, Welsh Heritage, previously with the Historic Houses Trust in New South Wales, the Heritage Lottery Fund in the UK, English Heritage and the Ironbridge Good Trust. And of course, we're also fortunate that, uh, that Kate has been tireless in, in writing about her experience and expertise and has published many books and articles and most recently her book, Playing with the Past, which is having um, an impact in uh, the teaching and, and training of heritage management um, techniques around the world. So I'm very fortunate um, in that Kate um, has been awarded the joint um, Australia ECOMOS University of Canberra Heritage Studies Scholarship. And I think all of us in ECOMOS are fortunate that Kate has chosen to take on this, this project as her most recent challenge. And she's going to talk about um, this project in her talk. And I invite you to please, um, as Kate talks, put your questions in the chat um, and we'll um, relay the questions to Kate um, at the end of her talk. So please, Kate, take it away. Thank you very much indeed, Tracy. Now let's just do the bit where I share my screen and look for my presentation and hopefully Are you seeing the right screen? I can only see you, Tracy. So have I got the right screen shared? Thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much, Tracy. Um, so I want to start tonight uh, by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose unceded land I'm speaking from and pay my respects to elders past and present and say how much I'm also looking forward to learning from Indigenous cultural heritage practitioners and academics throughout the course of this PhD. So I am absolutely thrilled and slightly daunted, a little bit terrified to have been awarded the um, Joint Australia ECOMOS University of Canberra Scholarship. It's a bit of a late life PhD crisis, I admit. And what I want to do tonight is take you through my approach to the PhD and some of my early thinking about the way forward and what we might do. Now, all of this, of course, starts with your PH, your research provocation, the one that you as Australia ECOMOS produced. There's a lot in that. There are a lot of important ideas in there. I think the key ones for me that have come back is that there is a growing amount of evidence for the economic, social and environmental benefits of protecting heritage, but we're still struggling to embed that in wider public policy and give it weight to it. So this is really the question that I've taken away from your provocation and the one that I think I want to try and get my head around in terms of this PhD. Now, of course, we always have to start with the NAMI question of heritage. And we know a lot of people tend to see heritage in terms of museums and monuments, but just 50 feet from the front of the new Chow Chak Wing Museum at the University of Sydney, you can see the reality of heritage all around us, not just in the extraordinary legacy of buildings at Sydney University. The weird things that academics seem to regard as heritage, my favourite Victoria Park Hall, but underpinning all of this, over 40,000 years of Indigenous cultural heritage, which for me really has to be the foundation and the starting point for everything that we do and think about in cultural heritage in Australia, which is why, as um, Helen mentioned earlier, the tragedy of Dukan Gorge and the destructions of those caves um, is, is so appalling, especially since these are things that we've long known about and long been trying to 
um, prevent. I've been reading through some of the report and beginning to look at some of the really powerful submissions that people have made. And there's a wealth of informed evidence there, particularly from the perspectives of Indigenous practitioners that I really need to get my head around in terms of starting um, this PhD. Uh, earlier mentioned, um, Helen mentioned some of the other um, responses that Australia ICOMOS have been doing to some of the other issues in the news at the moment, not least the current inquiry in New South Wales, which seems to have been prompted by the kind of usual political thing that heritage is a break on development. Um, interestingly, the report is actually quite su supportive, but also mentions the desperate lack of resources being accorded to supporting heritage at the moment. And I think that is really one of the, tr the, the problems that we're facing. But both of these reports give me um, who hasn't been working in Australia for a, while, a really useful insight into where you're coming from as practitioners and the issues that you are seeing. Um, the other foundation for this PhD is, of course, the whole question of heritage practice. And I think there is sometimes out there quite a cynical view of what we do and how we do it. But rather than engaging with that, I think I would have found that PhD in, I guess, my own practice based on four decades of experience in working in literally traditional heritage practice in the public sector. So I began in the late 70s as a young archaeologist digging holes. I went out with Peter White doing field survey in Western New South Wales, dug with Martin Gibbs down in, at Port Arthur, but also working on Islamic and Christian sites and in Central America. And those core archaeological field skills of looking at things through time and space is what I took, took into my first actual growing up paid job, um, an archaeological survey of the Iron Bridge Gorge, the so-called cradle of the Industrial Revolution. And I think like a lot of archaeologists, that taught me to think in terms of places, not sites, gave me a critical understanding of the nature of physical evidence and left me with a kind of deep-seated moral commitment as an archaeologist to conserving power, fabric as a powerful source of narrative that I think can really change, challenge established history. Uh, but we also had our fair share of tragedies. This is the first iron-framed building in the world. It is being demolished to make way for a coal mine in the 1980s because we did not understand the value of the site before that decision was made. And it was the start of a lifelong campaign for me at least to try and ensure that we understand things before we destroy them and not because we destroy them, which is what makes the Ducan Gorge even more tragic. The other thing that I took away from that experience at Ironbridge was really an understanding of the whole concept of value. I came across a lot of Jim Kerr's work back in the eighties and um, this idea of values at the heart of conservation. In 1989, I got up and argued perfectly successfully and with great confidence for the demolition of a listed concrete um, Henevik bridge because on balance, the contemporary view through the modern iron, through the historic iron bridge was more important. And that idea of values-based conservation has stayed with me ever since. My first, I went off to be an inspector of ancient monuments at English Heritage, dealing with around a thousand sites, mainly in private ownership. English Heritage was a bit of an authoritarian, I hate to say it, white male dominated place at the time, and some of us rebelled. My form of rebellion was actually to introduce Australian Barra Charter approaches and values-based practice to the UK. We brought Jim Kerr over. We had an amazing conference in Oxford in 1998 debating ideas of place and change and values and the whole idea of experts. Um, and in fact, a lot of that went on to influence things like the Farrow Convention. Informed conservation was my own attempt to raise the importance of understanding things in advance of conservation, of, of, of making decisions. We also had another bit of a rebellion at the time in the form of power of place, where we tried to really rethink, a radical rethink of heritage practice. And that emerged from two core things. I think firstly, this idea of sustainable development where we really learned to see heritage in the historic environment, not as something in isolation, but in part of wider social, economic and environmental issues. And the other thing, of course, was the death of the young architect, Stephen Lawrence, which was the 1990s Black Lives Matter moment and shone a light on institutional racism and has always stayed with me in terms of what we do. I also learned that good policies don't always survive politics. 
So after that, I joined the Heritage Lottery Fund. Now, because HF was a funder, not a statutory body, we were completely free to take a much broader view, an inclusive view of heritage. Heritage for us was what people valued. It ranged widely across natural and cultural heritage, tangible and intangible heritage. We used very much the same um, approach and we didn't tell people what their heritage was. We put people in the forefront of practice and a lot of our guidance was actually designed not for experts but for communities just to help them develop their own heritage projects. I was in charge of conservation so I introduced a whole values based approach that started with what people valued regardless of whether we were talking about trains or landscapes or oral history. But the other half of my job was I was head of research and evaluation. We've been spending around 300 million pounds a year on heritage. We had a whole lot of data and research, but we didn't have a big overall story, a theoretical approach to what that achieved. So I worked with people like Robert Hewison and John Holden, brought David Throsby over from Australia. And we did a conference and launched an approach which was all about the idea of the public value of heritage. It showed how ideas of, inform, of value not, inform not just what we do, but they informed why we do it because of the values that flow from heritage and how we do it and the importance of thinking about our own values in what we do. And that public value triangle, I find really useful. It works for me. It works for heritage practice. It gets us beyond significance to think about what our right values. Robert and John took it forward in their work on cultural leadership, and I found it really useful when I came back to Australia looking after the Historic Houses Trust of New South Wales later Sydney Living Museums. It's an amazing organisation looking after everything from the working class heritage of the rocks, the Museum of Sydney to at the time government house. We even had a beach and cows. I've got to say that looking after heritage sites and public ownership is really, really, really challenging, which is why we also had things like the Endangered Houses Fund, one of Australia's only revolving building preservation trusts to try and find private sector solutions to historic buildings. And the other thing I think I found was that as a leader of a cultural institution, concepts of value are really important. And I often went back to Mark Moore's work on public value and reminding that that's, that's a really core cool part of what you do because everybody and everyone has got a view on what you do. Um, I went back to the UK in 2014 uh, as director of CADU the Welsh Heritage Organisation. Now, Wales is a country where intangible cultural heritage in the form of language and music um, is really important. And also you were in a colonial context. So ideas of cultural heritage are really central. You, you've got to think about that when you're looking after heritage in Wales. We had things like a um, all Wales Heritage Interpretation Plan that challenged some of those kind of national stories of heritage. And I was really chuffed when we managed to sneak intangible heritage into the new heritage legislation. We managed to get heritage into areas such as social justice and regeneration. And the other thing about working in Wales, which is really powerful, is something called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act embeds wellbeing as a purpose for government. Now, Trey, um, Alison tells me that Bhutan also does this, but Wales is one of the few countries in the world to do that. There are seven wellbeing goals, one of which is a Wales of a th uh, thriving culture and Welsh language. So actually, whatever you're looking at in terms of public policy in Wales, whether you're looking at the visitor economy or transport, you've got to think about the impact on culture. So that was a really interesting approach. I retired from Welsh Government last year, came back to Australia, and here I am doing this um, PhD project. So back to the PhD, I've talked you through about through my initial theoretical approach, which really starts with this idea of heritage practice and what I call a kind of critical heritage practice based on what people value. Um, using that broad HLF division description of heritage that integrates natural, cultural, tangible and intangible. And I've put country in the middle of this picture because I think that really is an important concept that I think we can all share in terms of understanding the value and nature of heritage. Um, my approach, like all of us, is based on concepts of value. Um, and be but because heritage is inherently 
grounded in concepts of value. We also deal with a lot of conflicting values, where the conflicts between cultural and economic values, social and environmental values, and negotiating those conflicts is a lot of what we do. Heritage practice itself is very broad. We tend to think of about it as in terms of protecting monuments, and I've written designation on listing in red in the middle there. But most of what I've been done, I've done in my career has been nothing to do with that. A lot of my work has been in and around stewardship and looking after places, in providing services for the public, and the question of how we embed heritage in wider policy agendas. If heritage practice is very broad, also heritage practitioners are very broad. It's interesting that we learned from the National Trust earlier in the year that the majority of the people who own heritage assets in New South Wales are different New South Wales government departments. And there are a lot of people who care for and look after heritage, even though it is not their main role and it's not what they would see their job. We then got a range of heritage experts, such as elders and community leaders who really are an expert in their particular area of cultural heritage and then there's people like me which I'm called whether you call a specialist generalist I don't know but our role is essentially to care for the find ways to care for the heritage of others and I've worked mainly in um, state and local heritage bodies and in cultural institutions but that's only a small part of the sector and what generalists or specialists like all of us do is I think we stand proudly inside this idea of dominant heritage practice. We're focused on public value. We don't dictate what matters and why. Um, we work with a fairly imperfect set of public policy teams, tools. We try and work across different areas of public, of heritage practice. And I think increasingly, we're beginning to be able to get a place for heritage in those bigger agendas. And for those of you who've been following COP, it's just brilliant to see heritage up there talking about the role of cultural heritage in what is the really major overwhelming policy issue of our time, which has to be climate change. Unfortunately, a lot of what we do is a bit in, invisible because we're working either for commercial organizations or government ministers. So it's not always out there and publicly acknowledged. But I think we are all acutely aware of um, the political nature of heritages and the challenges around doing it. I heard Stuart Hall um, the well-known academic speaker in the 90s about heritage. I wrote this quote down and I've used it in almost every talk I've ever done since then because it's really powerful. And it always reminds me of the importance of taking a critical approach to what we do, challenging established models, being committed to public service, recognizing that we are in a privileged position uh, and also recognizing that we've got to acknowledge our own biases. So that's a little bit of a kind of theory rant from me because I think heritage practice itself is a really powerful and important thing. Um, in terms of the actual PhD itself, where do I start? Right, the first thing is to get my head around the sorts of things that you're all talking about and they're important for you. I talked about the submissions to Duke and Gorge and um, the New South Wales Heritage uh, Inquiry and you mentioned some others there. I'll be going through those, making sure I understand issues as you see them. I'm interested in recent research on heritage policy and practice in Australia, particularly anybody who's been doing policy research, project or program evaluations, impact research. I'd love to see you from you. It was great being in the ASHA conference early on, which was a brilliant conference, and great to hear about projects such as Susan Lawrence's sludge work, which is really showing how things like archaeology can help us understand wider issues like how we manage land. So I'm looking for all of that. In terms of the academic literature, um, Canberra is great because we've already had taught modules that have given us a really set us off on the right foot, including um, an introduction to some of the Indigenous literature from um, Indigenous scholarship. And um, that for me is a really powerful starting point. I love Tyson Unicorn Porter's um, diagram on the left, which I think is a great way of thinking about heritage. I'm interested in philosophy of practice um, as applied to cultural heritage, and of course, role in that work on that wider understanding of how heritage take is part of sustainability. The next thing I need to do is really get up to speed on where we are on the evidence for the benefits of heritage in Australia, heritage and well-being, 
heritage and livability, how it's contributing to placemaking, walkable neighbourhoods, healthy neighbourhoods, the whole environmental benefits of heritage, what's that literature looking like, how are we doing on embodied energy in existing buildings, the contribution of heritage to things like waste and decarbonisation, and then the wider economic benefits, including things like jobs and skills. I'm used to working in the UK where we've got the um, Heritage Counts work that covers a lot of this, and I'm looking forward to the uh, 2021 State of the Environment Report, which I'm hoping will get me there. So that research is actually what helps us to understand how heritage plays a role in those bigger policy agendas that I spoke about. So having looked at that, my next job is to think about what policy tools can we use? So I need to understand how Australian public policy works and the different policy tools that are in there for looking after the public interest. Um, we tend to think about listing a lot as heritage people as kind of the only tool that out, that's out there. As we know, it's a pretty terrible tool. It's very limited. It's problematic. It doesn't solve all sorts of things. Um, it's very hard to do. But I think there's a lot of other potential policy tools out there that we can look at in and around environmental management, regulation, I know this is mentioned um, in the in your research provocation, uh, uh, fiscal tools. Um, so I'm looking for possible case studies that I can take forward in this PhD from that shopping list. There's a range out there. Um, I've already done a little bit of work on asset management policy, but I particularly want to look at another gnarly one around appraisal and accounting policy. A policy. So uh, before I left Australia, I did some interesting work with Heritage New South Wales, looking at how you can use asset management strategies to find a new future for heritage, a positive role for state government heritage assets, and also hopefully involve, avoid creating heritage at risk through poor asset disposal strategies. So that showed me that there are ways that we can use other public policy mechanisms. Now, recently, um, for reasons best known to myself, I've been working in transport appraisal in Wales. And the whole process of transport appraisal is where you look at and make decisions about new major transport infrastructure. I have not mentioned the trams. In transport appraisal, you use something called benefit cost ratios based on monetized values for things like travel times and things. But there are also weighted with things like monetized values for biodiversity or water or air quality to compare different options. So this is an approach that is already in use for natural heritage. And the question I want to ask is whether we should, I should actually put my head in the lion's mouth. That's a lion. It's not a very good picture, but it's the nose at the top. And look for um, whether we should look at this approach for cultural heritage. Essentially, it's about putting numbers to heritage assets. Now for natural capital accounting, the starting point is this idea of an ecosystem services model that looks at the services natural heritage provides you and whether you can actually monetize that. If we go down that line for heritage, the whole question is we need to think about what services heritage actually provides. Um, and we can already think about heritage in terms of infrastructure and the assets, the services that heritage assets provide. There is the environmental services around reducing waste and decarbonisation, the well-being services that we know about the engagement that heritage delivers, place-based services and cultural services. Now, this is wildly controversial. Um, it's controversial in ecological approaches. It's going to be even more controversial in cultural heritage issues. But given the increasing financialization of all sorts of other areas of public life, including planning, we probably can't avoid it. So my gut instinct is that we should probably get our heads around it before the economists do it for us, recognizing that it's a crude, limited, brutal tool that does need a, a critical approach. And I think we'll never replace the kind of need to articulate values, which is absolutely central to heritage practice. But if I go back to those Chukan Gorge submissions, it is an approach that gets under the to the heart of some of the issues, um, particularly raised by ind ind Indigenous stakeholders in responses to that. So I think, you know, at the risk of being controversial, I might want I might poke that one with a stick. At the end of the day, um, there we are. No pressure. I think from my point of view, I hope what I do um, 
on what I'm doing respects at least some of the concerns that you've raised in your provocation. I'd love, I went on about heritage practice a lot, but I did it for a reason, because I'd love to see a stronger academic voice for critical heritage practice out there. I think it's important. I'd love, I'm not sure that I can achieve this, but I'd love to see greater weight for heritage in Australian public policy. And the philosopher in me would like to have a little go at that funny space between economic and cultural models of value. Um, remembering that you've raised a lot of big issues in your provocation and I can't deal with all of them. So thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to the Australia ECOMOS subcommittee who have offered to support. I'd love to talk to um, any of you, particularly people who have got or are doing research that might be relevant to this. I'd love the chance to do some online Zoom conversations with groups, particularly um, Indigenous practitioners, consultants, and people in the public sector, just to talk about the issues that see uh, that you care about. And I'm really looking forward to the Pathways event and hearing from emerging young professionals. You can contact me on either of those emails. Um, I've put, because I'm being a good academic, um, some of the reading that I've already begun to look at and is turning out to be quite useful. Hopefully this will go up somewhere. If anybody's interested in that cultural capital stuff, um, there's a few readings here. And Tracy mentioned earlier um, some of the other things I've written. Most of it's up on my academia or my Roots Search Great Gate site, but I would do an advertisement for the Playing for the Past, which has got around 80 games and activities to help you think about value in your work. And it's got pictures. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the opportunity. And has anybody got any questions? Thank you so much, Kate. That was a brilliant, um, brilliant talk. Um, so exciting and covering so much ground. Um, if it's okay with the other members, I'll relay the um, questions to Kate. Is that how we should work? I think, yes, great. So Kate, we've got a few um, questions, first of all, uh, or, and comments. First of all, Edwina Jans notes that um, the ACT government has recently embedded um, a wellbeing framework into um, their government um, public policy decision-making framework. Thank you for that. that. I think I'd heard a rumour about that and um, I'd definitely like to follow up on that because the experience of working with that in Wales has been amazing and it's been really useful. So thank you for that. That's um, on my follow up, on note to follow up, note to self. Um, and the, the next from Kerame Dennis. Um, thanks, Kate, for sharing such a diverse experience that you've had in the heritage field. If you could pick one, what would be your most challenging experience or issue across your entire career? Oh, God. <laughs> no, where do I start? Well, there's a whole lot of them. I've got to say probably st starting in Wales, um, in a new country with a new country, um, in a new language, because of course, um, there's a lot of pressure to speak Welsh, which I don't, and um, really getting my head around that. So that that was quite challenging for me and a new minister within a week of joining. So that was my most challenging, but there's been a string of challenges through the time. Yes, we, we, uh, we hope to hear more um perhaps on that um, Kate we can uh, we can diarize them as, as they um, as they occur um, the next one's from Helen Ladner um, Kate how do we get more champions for heritage across the whole of society it's a really good question um, we back in the 90s we came up with this idea of heritage champions in when I was working in English heritage and we worked with local authorities to try and get local authorities to sort of have local heritage champions because local authorities are such important places for heritage and so much goes on in that space. And we really wanted to kind of support them as a group and help them recognizing that, you know, a lot of them wouldn't necessarily come out of a, out of a heritage background. So that was one initiative. It kind of went by the wayside because I think English heritage lost a little bit of um, oomph and support in it. I think the other thing is um, recognizing, and I know that there's a lot of work already with heritage volunteers, but recognizing and 
celebrating the range of people you know who I put at the beginning of my list of, of people who do heritage who don't see heritage as their day job but actually are really involved in it all the time um, you know I know for example Alison Wayne is working with a whole lot of people in, 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 in the engineering heritage space faith groups I mean it's amazing when you think about it how many sectors of society actually play a role in heritage but wouldn't necessarily use the h word so finding ways to acknowledge, celebrate and talk about that um, rather than talking about us, which is, I think, a little bit boring. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. And the next one's from Steve Brown, um, who thanks you for the great overview. And he's interested in your diagram of natural, cultural, tangible, intangible as overlapping circles. Do you think there are ways to see all of these spheres as so deeply interconnected that creating circles, in fact, works against the worldview of entanglement and inseparability. <laughs> I think that's why I put country in the middle. Because for me, you know, just, just reading my way into it, it's just such a lovely way of thinking um, and looking at some of uh, uh, Tyson's diagram of country. It, it kind of says it all for me. I think we white people have stuck things in boxes and it doesn't work. Um, so I'd love to find a kind of language and way of talking about that. But certainly in the work that I've done on, even on conservation planning, yeah, you cannot see sites and places in terms of the professional boxes that we all work in. It just doesn't work. So find, and that's why for me, a values-based approach that says, not looking at heritage in terms of, oh, I don't know, it's a building or it's a landscape or it's an object or it's a piece of intangible heritage but thinking about the value of what we've got um, is such a powerful way of working and such a powerful way of connecting it all. Great. Um, the next one um, comes from Australia Ikimos who I probably should know who's um, sitting behind that Zoom account but I, I don't um, but it's um, how does Wales co-celebrate a contested post-colonial heritage. Is there space for duality? Interesting juxtaposition to the Australian context. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So in Wales, um, it, Wales is very conscious of being the UK's first colony. Um, Plaid, Plaid Cymru um, is, you know, does have a significant role, uh, probably plays the same role that the Nats play here. Um, Welsh language, there is the Welsh language measure that puts, um, so you need to use Welsh language first in, in, in your talk. And you do need to be consciously aware of it, which is why things like that Pan Wales Interpretation Plan are so important, because that's about, I think it's probably one of the few countries that I know of that has a whole country interpretation plan, pulling out things like um, the princes of Dehaibath, the Welsh princes that preceded um, you know, Edward I and was subsumed by Edward I. So for a lot of Welsh people, those castles, like Carnarvon Castle, are places they will not go near. Um, there was huge controversy over the inauguration of Prince Charles, and it's still a lot of Welsh people won't go in there. Um, but I, do, I think that actually makes heritage a strength in Wales and not a weakness. And I think Wales is very com confident with that. In fact, the last minister I worked with was a proud Welsh-speaking nationalist who was also perfectly happy about renaming the bridge, the Prince of Wales Bridge. So I think Wales lives very happily with a lot of that duality, but it's something that you need to be very aware of and very conscious of in terms of how you approach heritage, the legislation that you use and how you talk about it. Thanks, Kate. Um, this, there's some fantastic uh, comments and tips and tricks in the, um, in the chat, which we can capture for you yeah, for no, later. I'm looking at those if comments. We've got, yeah, thank you. Great, but if we've got I, time for one I, final question, I'd like to. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to respond um, briefly to Steve Brown, which is why I think I, I privileged and put Indigenous concepts of heritage at the front of my literature review and research, because I thought, for me, starting there rather than finishing there was was the right thing to do, and it's something I want to learn from, and for me, um, the way to break down the duality is to start somewhere else. 
Sorry, Tracy, you were going to ask something. That's great. I just I thought we must it must be time um, to to about wrap up, but I wondered if we could have uh, Duncan Marshall's question because I really like his question, um, which is what does critical heritage practice mean, Kate? Um, for me, it means uh, recognizing firstly that heritage practice is in a of itself something that we do and there's something important it's not just a kind of power crazy maniac expert led lunacy attempting to protect monuments against all comers and by a critical approach which i tried to put on that slide um, which i skipped over quite rapidly um, because of time uh, but my version of critical approach is to put other people's values at the forefront to question my own assumptions and implicit biases to recognize that I work in a privileged position and therefore the responsibilities that come with that. But also, I, hate, I actually don't even like the word critical. Um, for me, it's also about a compassionate heritage practice uh, a compa that recognizes that heritage is a powerful thing, that if we're dealing with other people's heritage, which is often powerfully important to them and deep seated, we need to listen and be compassionate and respect that and do what we can to use that rather rubbish toolkit that we've got to try and find greater weight for cultural values and other people's stories in our national life and in the places around us. Thank you, Kate. That was a lovely answer. Um, and thank you to everyone for the other comments in the chat, which will which will Can harvest. I just, I'm going to jump um, in. I'm going to tell Ken, yeah. yes, I've got that. That <laughs> was in my literature review, and I'm really interested in the environmental governance framework as a frame for this essay. Chapter headings to follow. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that was a brilliant address, Kate. Thank you so much much exciting times ahead um, and I'm sure everyone will join me in uh, giving you a big uh, round of applause and, and thanking you for sharing um, your your um, fantastic research agenda and I'll hand back 